check. Okay. <clears throat> Look at that, a million and a half views. Wow, almost 19,000, that's crazy. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today, we're going to be looking at the art of Horace Pippin and this painting, Giant Daffodils from 1940. I think this is a beautiful painting. It's a fun painting. Uh, Horace Pippin was a great artist, a, a really uh, spectacular individual who overcame so much and uh, whose art was both um, very uplifting and positive like some of these images and also displayed some of the horrors that he himself experienced both as a soldier in World War I and as an African American growing up in the United States at the turn of the last cent century where he faced vicious, vicious bigotry and used his art as a vessel to talk about those issues as well as a kind of therapy to overcome many of the things that he experienced. So I'm super excited to take a look at Horace Pippin today and to attempt to recreate this incredible painting. Okay, so if you're new to the show and you're, this is the first time you're joining us, this is the, the uh, steps that we're going to proceed by. And if you watch the video after it was recorded, you can jump to the various different uh, stamps in the playlist or in the timeline down below. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the image stained with a little bit of color, or sorry, we're going to get the image on the canvas first, and then we're going to stain it. That's the imprimatura. Mm, I love the word. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about Hor who Horace Pippin was. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do an underpainting today. Uh, yeah, probably not. I think we can go right into it. Then we're gonna, so we'll probably then go right into the background, paint the sky, and then we're gonna paint the daffodils and the fence and the dog in the front. And uh, we should be done in about three hours, I hope. Um, even though this is not the most complex painting, it's still there's detail in here that's gonna take us some time. Okay. So, as well, um, if you, I would strongly encourage you and hope and wish that you would hit the like button right now, or you can reserve judgment until later on in the video, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you know when upcoming videos are happening, because my schedule is all over the place right now while I'm trying to figure out how to, to squeeze these episodes in when I can. So they are taking place generally not on usual schedule, so hit that notification bell. As well as if you want to support the channel for as little as 25 cents or a dollar, as people have done many times in the past, consider using PayPal. You can use the YouTube Super Chat function directly here within YouTube. Or you can contact me through my email, which is on my website, or through the Facebook group and send an e-transfer. Um, those are the that's the best way to save the most amount of your to ensure I get most of your money and uh, YouTube take, takes like 40% of your donation um, but I'm grateful for whatever money um, uh, you might support the channel with again there's lots of other ways you could support the channel including joining our Facebook group so when you're done your painting take a moment take a photograph and upload it to the Facebook group and if you don't if you don't belong to the Facebook group do it right now uh, what an incredible community I think now we're over 700 people the last couple days we crossed over that boundary um, broke that ceiling so growing by leaps and bounds every single day okay so let's go to our first step here Let's get the image onto the canvas. Now, there I've done a free outline of today's uh, image. So here's the original artwork, and then here's the outline that I did. I used the Procreate app on my iPad Pro. I just traced it out, and I'll show you where you can download this for free. Uh, there's a Dropbox link in the description below, and you'll see at the very top of that link, there's some of our introductory how to paint, how to mix color um, tools up here. And then the next, I don't know, 40 or so uh, links here or, or folders 
are for our introductory basic paintings, although there are some more complex ones that got mixed in here. And then there's another 150, 200 folders down there that are a little more complicated, like the Mona Lisa, for instance. But if we look at, whoop, Horace Pippin, we go in here. You're gonna see there's a bunch of images in here because I'm gonna do another sort of spontaneous episode on Friday. So I'll just show you, we, of course we've got the original artwork here, uh, giant daffodils, as well as the outline. And then this is the painting we're gonna make on Thursday. This is Horace Pippin's portrait of George Washington. There's also another painting here, floral still life from 1944 that he did that I'm not going to do this painting, but I did do the outline because I couldn't decide what to do and what not to do because I can only do so many paintings. Um, I love like this one as well. I love that bright yellow. And then this is another painting that's attributed to Horace Pippin. I really like this painting, but because the, the authorship is contested, I felt like if I'm only going to be able to devote one or two episodes to this master, I don't want to devote an episode to a painting which could a couple of years from now be totally debunked as either a fake or by another artist that was just misattributed to him. So while I do like this painting, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I love that little cat there. Um, I think, it, you know, when we take a look at Horace P Pippin and the way that he painted some of these flowers and leaves, this, it just seems very different than the way he did it. I, it's possible, but I just, I think there's a number of other artists that could be uh, by. Anyway, so you can download the, the outline from the Dropbox, print it out on your home inkjet printer at home, just as I have, and then we're going to transfer it onto the canvas, and I'll show you how I do that. So the first thing is first, is I've got this nine by 12 sized canvas board or canvas panel that I ordered from Amazon. I like this brand, but sometimes the price goes up wildly up and down. You, you don't really wanna pay more than a couple dollars for a canvas board. You can buy these for like five, for, I was just at Michael's Art Supply, you can buy five for 12 or $15, I think, at Michael's Art Supply. Just seems a little bit more on the expensive side. I try to get mine a little bit cheaper. Amazon's a pretty good place for that. But again, so there's links for it in the description below. You just wanna make sure that, uh, you know, that you're paying a fair price for it because sometimes the the price will fluctuate wildly. I've seen it like a hundred dollars for 24. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's way too much for one uh, for a set of these. Okay, so I just taped it down right into the middle of the the canvas there. Sometimes I kind of go to lengths to make sure that's straight, but I think uh, we can always do that later on as well. And now I'm going to use some carbon transfer paper now this tech actually this is graphite transfer paper that i've just put in this envelope after i ran out of carbon transfer paper 250 paintings ago uh, but it does virtually the same thing i mean our base it it does the exact same thing but it is a different material um, most people aren't going to notice any difference whatsoever probably including myself um, i would imagine carbon paper might smudge a little bit easier than graphite paper but that's just a, a bit of a wild guess so i'm not going to trace over everything i just want to keep um, the most basic lines in and it's a good idea just to double check make sure that your lines are in fact getting to the other side there because i have on occasion gone all the way around and realized oh None of my lines made it onto the other side. So I'm just going to start by outlining the fence. What is that? big f daffodils here so I could it's pretty hard to see some of the details in 
these uh, the daffod or in the leaves surrounding the daffodils. So I'm not going to spend too. I'm really not going to even do any of the outlines in there because I wasn't really able. To, a lot of what I've seen here is kind of me trying to find the detail in those really dark areas. So these may or may not be super accurate. These these lines. Okay, and then these rocks. And then the dog. And again, I'm also not going to do all of the lines here. Just the outlines is good enough. And we'll, we'll put the signature here. This will get covered up with paint very quickly, but I'll just put it there anyway, just for so I can say I did it. <laughs> okay, looks good. I, I always kind of do a quick little double check just to make sure I got all the lines on there and there's not something major missing. Like, I, for instance, just a moment ago, I almost forgot the eye on the dog. So. Now, I like to keep this handy just to, to refer to. Sometimes it's easier than looking at the at the painting because I've already kind of broken down the, the major details there. Wow, look at all the comments in the chat. Um, wow, there's Lolly and Deborah and Nikki there. and There's my mom is there too. Happy Valentine's Day, Mom. Um, Lolly says, I always hit the like button even before the stream starts, as I know it'll always be an amazing class and an amazing painting. Oh, you're too sweet, Lolly. Uh, Pascaline is there. It's midnight here, and I am... and I'm sleepy. <laughs> oh, Nikki, you're so sweet. Oh, my mom's they're at the pub, and they're watching... <laughs> they're watching with the whole family at the pub. Okay, that's awesome. Well, have a have some good wings for me there. I'm I'm, I'm assuming that's probably what they're having. It's chicken wings. Love the wings. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the next step here. Where is my list of things to do? Okay. So our next step is to stain this with a little bit of color, and. One, um, what we're about, and, and this next step is called the imprimatura, and essentially it means like the priming layer or the first layer of paint. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to stain it with some warm yellow. Now, this is the brand of paint, and the color and paint I'm about to use is called Azo Yellow Deep. It's a warm yellow. So you can see here I've got eight tubes of paint that I'm about to, to break out. In fact, I'm, I'm not even going to use the oxide black there at the very bottom. I'm only going to use six colors plus white. Now this is called a split primary palette because we're splitting the, the primary, quote unquote, primary colors into two, a warm and a cool, of which every color is a temp has a temperature, um, whether it be warm or cool, some more cool and more, more warm than others, of course. Um, but uh, I'm not sponsored or paid by anybody. I haven't gotten any free stuff or any encouragement or anything from anybody. This is just my recommendations. We've done 260 plus paintings and they all worked beautifully with this, what we would consider a student grade paint. Now, um, if you want to use a more expensive artist brand, uh, artist grade, you could use Golden, and these are the colors I would suggest, or Liquitex. This is their student grade. They have a professional grade as well. Windsor & Newton, Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supply Chain, Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Fevacryl, Nova Color, Chroma Color, but not Museum Color because they put white into the paint, which is just insane. I don't know why they would do that, but uh, it makes it very difficult to get the colors you want. So, um, 
unless you want to mix grays, in which case then it's perfect for that because it's already got some white in it. Okay. So, maybe that's actually a bit much. Okay. So I'm going to take some of this warm yellow and a little bit of water. This is the only time I use water when I'm painting with acrylic paint here. I'm going to stir it up nice and good. Um, the water is just going to help the paint um, dry a little bit faster. It's going to help it spread a little bit easier because, as I said, we're basically just staining this surface. Now, throughout history, artists have used primarily brown to do this step, like a warm red, or like a reddish, or a, a, a reddish brown, um, a rusty red, as I often say, um, earthy red tone. Or, or earthy red hue, I mean. You'll notice I also like getting these edges. I like, I like when there's a little bit of extra thought paid to the side of the paintings. When I'm in art museums, I'm always looking at paintings from the side, and you can see the security guards think, is that guy, is he looking at how it's hung? Because he's going to come back here and take it off the wall in the middle of the night. I might be doing that as well. <laughs> but mostly I'm looking to see what the artist did to the sides of the painting. Because I always think that that displays a certain amount of craftsmanship. You know, it's, it's a part of the artwork that's not necessarily visible to most people unless they look for it. And so it's like, well, what did they do there? Did they just leave it blank? Or did they spend some time thinking about it, the painting as a bit of an object as well? And So, okay. Also, you can see there that before I put my brush in the water, I just wipe off all the excess. I got a, a, a old uh, towel here, and that just um, uh, takes up. You can see it just turns into this crunchy mess. But this does a few things. First of all, it keeps, if I wipe all the excess paint off on a rag rather than the water, the water, I can paint for hours and hours with this little cup of water and never need to clean that water. Um, second of all, Kind of a dirty secret about art is that so much um, paint goes down the drain and goes right out into our uh, into the oceans and rivers and pollutes the fish and then we eat the fish and we and we wonder why we're so sick. All right, so in this case, at least that paint is going on to a rag that goes into a landfill rather than directly into the, back into the food cycle. So I got a three-year-old daughter, and I always want to leave the best, leave the world as, as, as healthy as possible for the future generations. Okay, um, I'm out of my cool red, so let's just take this jar. I often find I use very little cool red, and there might not be much in this painting. So we'll just uh, put a little bit out. We'll see. You know, if I want, I can always put it back into the jar. Okay, there's my paint. Got my painting. And I think we are ready to move on. Um, 
Lolly says, talking to Pascaline, have, how have you found the extra layers of gesso you mentioned in previous streams? I prepped a bunch of canvases, but haven't used them yet. Just wondering how you found, if you got a better result. And Pascaline says, Lolly, yes, so much better. Two layers of gesso. Yeah, so um, that's also what I've, I also, I forgot to mention um, before I did the image transfer, is I also coat each one of these panels. They usually come wrapped in plastic. I take the plastic off. And then I coat it with white acrylic gesso. That dries, and then I sand it. I've got my sand. I used to do this at the beginning of every episode. If you watch some of the older episodes, I'd start by just quickly sanding it. And then I started noticing there was lots of, of uh, gesso dust all over everything in the studio. So now I do that outside, and I do like 100 canvases all at the same time. I got them all gessoed, laying all over. Let them dry, pick them up, go outside, sand them outside so that's not in my living space that I'm breathing it in my studio. But that gesso fills in the, the texture of the canvas. I always use the example of a canvas is like a waffle. And, you know, if you've got a waffle and you're, then you try to butter that waffle, you know, you get, you know, if this is a waffle and you got butter on your waffle, you get like that far across and then you got to get more butter. And you're going to get more butter. And by the time you're half of the stick of a chunk of pound of butter is up, right? So it's the same sort of thing with the canvas. If you've got all that that weave and then you try to brush paint over it, well, the paint comes all the way off your brush on that first, right as it touches the canvas. The smoother the canvas is, the more you can get a unified, even brush stroke. So, um, honestly, I don't even know why more canvases don't come pre-gessoed with two or three layers of gesso that's been nicely sanded. I think it would make people's lives a lot easier to paint on such a surface. Anyway, there's the, the world is full of wonders, right? And there's Sandra. Sandra, I'm, I'm, I owe you some emails and things. My apologies. I'm way behind on, on that. I, I, you're in the back of my mind there. I'm just, I apologize. It's been, been needless to, to say a, a busy time. Okay. So let's move on to the next step here. Oh, so let's, okay. So while um, the canvas, the input amateur is drying here, let's talk a little bit about who Horace Pippin was. So I've got some links here that I wanna show you. So Horace Pippin is born in 1888 and dies in 1946. And so, you know, at the age of uh, only 58, and what's a shame is that really Horace Pippin doesn't really break through until, you know, the mid, or, well, yeah, mid-1930s, late 1930s. And towards the end of his life, he has achieved, like, kind of an unprecedented amount of celebrity. And then he passes away kind of suddenly, which is a real shame because... Who knows where he would have gone, what he would have been able to accomplish had he had another decade or so uh, to to continue uh, as an artist. Anyway, um, so Horace Pippin was born in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and I just want to show you um, kind of a map here. So uh, Westchester, Pennsylvania, if I just zoom in here is a kind of sub well not a suburb but a oh oh, oh. it's uh, you know a, a, a town i wonder you know how far away that is probably about an hour east or or west of philadelphia um and if let's zoom in here because his former house Come on, what's going on here? Is um has a historical land is a historical landmark, and there's the where's the post? There we are. So here's the historic marker in front of his house, born in Westchester, 1888, Pippin 
occupied this house from 1920 until his death in 1946. A self-taught black artist, he painted while living here such notable works as Domino Players, John Brown Going to His Hanging, and the Holy Mountain series. Um, so, uh, this is where, so again, he spent almost his entire life in this area here, except for a few instances where he traveled towards the end of his life to some exhibitions and to World War, World War I, where he fought uh, on behalf of the Allies. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. So, what is, um, what's, Horse Pippin's parents um, and, and, and all of his family had been uh, slaves and, and had been brought over um, in various different slave ships um, over the, the centuries. And so Horse Pippin growing up, even though he was born about a, just over a decade after the end of slavery, although... Um, there were still some uh, lots of lingering effects from slavery. It didn't just come to an to an end, especially in the South. But um, he kind of carried, you know, the, the 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 horror of slavery throughout his childhood. You know, if your parents had been enslaved, and uh, that would have made quite the impact on you growing up, um, and the particular kind of outlook that this young boy would have had as a child. Um, he never knew his father. He was raised by a single mom, and his mother Harriet um, did everything she could to support him. Uh, Pippin was interested in art, but being a, a child growing up in, in relative poverty, there, he didn't really have um, art supplies to speak of. Some of the things that he used to draw with uh, were he would take um, like the fire poker and 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 burn and scrape into wood. Uh, he would draw with like the charcoal from the fireplace. So he was, you know, so if, if you're going to use whatever material is available to you because you just feel so compelled to draw, that to me is like an artist. You know, there's no, ex he's a guy who had no excuses or he made no excuses for him. He had potentially lots of excuses, but he never used them. He he was constantly in search of, of um, ways to communicate the, the world and his experiences of it. And um, when, so he, one thing he started doing is entering various different contests for art supplies. So there was lots of like, you know, as there are, well, I think less so today. I, even as a kid growing up, I remember just constantly in the back of comic books and newspapers, magazines, like there would be these contests to enter. And so one of the, he, he won a, a drawing contest at age 10. And that contest provided him with a set of colored crayons and watercolors. And, um, um, and so he began putting th those to use. And so his initial, most of his initial work is, is done in watercolor. Uh, it's later on that he be, he starts painting on oil. The painting we're going to make on Thursday was actually oil on glass. Um, so again, you just see like whatever's around, he's going to use as an art material. Because sometimes, as many of you probably know, art materials to this day can be kind of expensive, right? There's a bit of an investment that goes into it. Um, so he uh, he's he's making some artwork as a child, but... By the age 14, he has to drop out of school so that he can help his mother. Um, he can he can go work in various different factories as like an elevator boy. Um, more like did every single sort of odd job you can imagine. Uh, so again, that's also another tragic part of um, that era and of just people in poverty in general is uh, their educational opportunities become limited uh, because he's he's entering the workforce at age 14 so um and the only reason that that comes to an end is that he's conscripted into world war one when that breaks out and so he joins up with let me just make sure i get this right 
with K Company in the 3rd Battalion of the 369th Infantry Regiment, um, known as the Harlem Hellfighters. And it's a predominantly uh, African-American unit of soldiers that is actually comes under the command of the French army because American soldiers in World War I, many of them did not want to fight or march alongside their fellow African-Americans. So um, one of the ways that, that African-American soldiers uh, had the opportunity to serve, if you want to say that in air quotes, to go fight as if that a, a good thing was to fight under the French flag. And um, so he goes to the, the, the front lines in World War I. And you can also imagine that, um, that people of color were also sort of the first people sent um, over, the, over the hill to, to, into the wave of, of, um, of gunfire and uh, uh, machine guns and cannons and tanks and barbed wire uh, because they were seen as, as less than their white um, um, peers, their fellow soldiers. So, and that was quite common. Even Canadians and Australians, New Zealanders were, um, were sent over uh, the out of the trenches by the British commanders because back in World War I, Canada was just a, uh, an English colony. And so the Canadians and Australians and the uh, East Indians and wherever else were always sort of seen as sort of disposable. And then the, the English would come in and, and um, mop up and get to march proudly um, after all the hard work was done. I'm sort of paraphrasing a little bit. I'm oversimplifying World War I there. But so needless to say that these African-American soldiers in World War I saw some of the, the worst, heaviest combat of all um, because they were just thrown right into the meat grinder um, and seen as totally uh, uh, disposable. And uh, not 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 long after he's in the war, you know, the Americans enter the war in, in uh, 1917, and in September of 1918, he's shot in the shoulder by a German sniper, and and wounded severely enough that he's he's sent back um, behind the lines to recover and eventually given an honorable discharge. Um, interestingly enough, he was awarded the Purple Heart in 1945, like. 30 years after the war, he is uh, retroactively given that award. Um, uh, and he says here of his combat experience, I did not care what or where I went. I asked God to help me, and he did so. And that is the way I came through that terrible and hellish place. For the whole entire battlefield was hell. So it was no place for any human being to be. Um, and he talks about marching... And you, would, you could tell who the new soldiers were because when um, uh, explosions or incoming fire were, were, uh, were approaching, all the newbies would, would scramble and, and dive down and all the veterans like himself would just keep on marching because they were just like, you know what, if it's going to hit me, it's going to hit me here, it's going to hit me in the trench, it's going to hit me wherever, so there's, there's no point, <laughs> just keep on marching. Um, and so he was very fortunate to be able to get out of the war when he did. Um, and one of the things, the, the main things he does while he's convalescing is he starts drawing again. And he, off, he really saw drawing as, uh, there's a quote of his, I, I put it in the, um, uh, in the, the Facebook page. How do, what was the, th let me see. I just want to get the quote right. Ah, um, what does he say? Um, he credits the war with having brought out the art in me, or brought out all the art in me, which I think is interesting because, you know, there was this period of time for about twenty years where he was really focused on working and it didn't really have a chance to do much art at all. And it's because of the war and everything that he saw and experienced that he feels very compelled to start making art again. 
and which is not unusual. There were, uh, you know, especially today, art therapy is one of the main ways that uh, veterans are uh, an option for them to help overcome like some of the, you know, what they used to call shell shock or PTSD today. Um, and I couldn't be more supportive of that. I think, I think everybody should be doing art, but uh, what I think it's such a positive um, way of dealing with the trauma that the that one would have experienced in World War One was, you know, I mean every war is horrible, but World War One, uh, I think there's no way for us today to really comprehend the scale of the of the destruction that that I mean we're talking millions and millions of people dying, you know on a yearly basis and it just being just you know i mean there's you know very little in terms of medical care um and yeah it's just just brutal anyway so he he returns from uh world war one and promptly gets married he, he marries a woman who's who had been widowed twice already and had a child and he raised this child as his own and he also credits his wife as helping kind of uh, provide an opportunity, some stability for him so that he could kind of re-enter society and, and focus more on his art. He really doesn't, he makes his first artwork, um, uh, first oil painting, I think in 1930, 1930, I think. So really it's not until age, what, 43 that he makes his first oil painting. Up until then, he's been making, you know, drawings with crayons, charcoal from the fireplace, burning things onto wood panels. Um, and so after World War One, he's he's able to kind of afford some proper art supplies. And that's when he starts making his artwork. And let's just take a quick um, view at some of these paintings. Uh, so Horace Pippin was sort of all over the place in terms of the subject matter that fascinated him the most. Uh, he did landscapes, he did still life paintings. Today's kind of like a still life landscape painting in some way. Um, he also did history paintings. He illustrated scenes from World War I that he himself saw and experienced, and that was one way he helped process those uh, feelings and and visions, uh, as well as he did a lot of illustrations of biblical scenes as well. That was another kind of, because the church and religion and spirituality was something that was very, very dear to him and probably helped him through some of those dark, dark times. Um, you know, I mean, some of these paintings of like watching the, the dog fights over the trenches while him and a comrade are sitting in there and... You know the those I think you know we we romanticize the life of those fighter pilots back in World War One, but that was really the the most dangerous. The life expectancy of a of a fighter pilot in World War One was very low. Your chances of coming home were very very low. So I think that's partly why they were so romanticized because um, chances are they weren't going to be coming home. So they were kind of treated like celebrities while they had the chance, right? Um, I think this is great too. I, I also, this is another painting of Horace Pippins that I was con strongly considering doing this painted version, this painting of his wife, I think is really beautiful. Uh, I, I love kind of her, her kind of big, broad shoulders, right? And, and um, there's, a, there's a lot of love in that painting, but it's also like there's, it's, uh, it's a kind of serious and almost, not a somber painting, but it's just a, you know, not a celebratory painting. I'm sure that the that again, I'm sure his wife had also experienced some horrific uh, bigotry growing up as well. So, you know, not not a lot of happy times, I think. And I, yet, you know, you see almost every photograph of Horace Pippin, of which there's not that many. Most of the time, he's got a big smile on his face. I think he felt quite fortunate to have made it through World War One. And because um, many of the people st who stood shoulder to shoulder with did not return. Um, here's one of his collectors. 
You could see kind of why, when I said that other painting that's attributed to Horace Pippin, this seems a little bit suspect to me that it would be by him. It just doesn't have uh, many of the same qualities. Even just the colors of his paintings tend to be a little bit more muted. There's a couple self-portraits by Pippin that I also really like, that I also strongly considered doing. And I was going to suggest, while we, I made that painting, that, that people watching paint their own self-portrait. Um, but I also really liked this painting to, that we're about to do, the daffodils as well. So, uh, what? Okay, so at the, just to kind of, kind of circle back here. So he's kind of painting um, in relative obscurity until he he uh, wins a couple of very kind of small awards and starts kind of getting on the radar of some very important art collectors in Philadelphia, um, most notably Albert C. Barnes. And um, Albert Barnes was a, you know, a very wealthy man who's the founder of the Barnes Foundation, which is really the, you know, one of the, the main philanthropic organizations in the United States, especially for the arts. And so the fact that he got onto Barnes's radar was very important because uh, shortly thereafter, he is included in this exhibition organized by the Museum of Modern Art, a touring exhibition called Masters of Popular Painting in 1938. And that immediately catapults him into the stratosphere. So he goes from sort of being mostly unknown, unappreciated. He's now in his like early 50s. And he um, he becomes sort of like a major celebrity. This this exhibition, Masters of Popular Painting, was one of the first exhibitions to um, to put a spotlight on what is what was called outsider art or folk art, and um, and which is which are controversial terms these days because they're often used. Uh, to describe people of color who did not have a traditional art education who made art. And so often they were called primitive artists, uh, which is, I think, is, is, you know, very, um, has a lot of very negative connotations, that idea of something being primitive, because it's always used in comparison to, you know, a um, sophisticated white person, right? Um, and, or a... Um, yeah, so, but needless to say, you know, the way that Horace Pippin has been described over the years is sort of the most, most important folk artist of the, the first half of the 20th century. Um, and, you know, followed by people like Grandma Moses, for instance, or here in Canada. Um, oh, Oh my goodness, we did a couple of her paintings. It's going to drive me crazy. Oh my goodness. Um, anyway, uh, why is that just... But, so folk art is 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 often... You know, there's there's some people who, who, who love folk art. And um, I think that those... The, the thing is, though, the, these distinctions between what is a, a fine artwork and a folk artwork are really, you know, based on some outdated racial stereotypes that are very classicist. Um, so you don't hear those terms used so much anymore uh, than they once were, even 10, 15 years ago. Um, uh, because, you know, one might, we, we've looked at a number of, of well-known artists who had little to no art education but became very famous. Like, for instance, let's say Tom Thompson arguably Canada's most important influential painter uh, had very little uh, art education, especially compared to his friends who went on to form the Group of Seven. I've never heard anyone refer to Tom Thompson as a quote-unquote folk artist or a primitive artist, even though the only, as, we, as far as we know, really only had um, uh, maybe a half dozen uh, evening classes from an artist named William Cruikshank. So, yeah, it's, again, this is kind of tricky. I just think it's important to mention that because even in in sort of this uh, 
uh, Wikipedia entry. I don't really remember ever seeing anything mentioning folk art or primitive art in here anymore. Um, yeah, it's, uh, anyway, I think we should get on to the painting itself, but I just, you know, some of these, I just see if we could just quickly look one last time. Another thing I also think is actually very interesting about Horace Pippin is he, in s not always, but in many occasions, actually built the frames for his own artwork. And here you can see, like, this, the inclusion of these helmets and grenades and tanks on the on the outer edges of the frame which kind of add an extra little bit of layer to it and sometimes that's considered to be a folk art practice in and of itself as well but there are again other examples of artists like uh pierre mondrian who's famous for the um I thought I had a Mondrian painting we did here. You know, the the, the grids with the yellow, blue, and um, reds in there. He also famously built all of his frames. Francis Bacon, the great um, figure, abstract figurative painter from the 1950s and 60s from um, Ireland. Uh, he, well, he, I don't know if he built his own frames, but he, he had all of his frames custom made. Everything that had to be behind glass. So... Yeah, anyway, uh, I'll just see if there's any couple more here. Uh, oh, this is also a very famous... We should just sort of take a quick look at this. Um, because this is painting is John Brown on his way to his hanging. I think that's what it's called. And uh, this shows the the, the anti-slavery uh, abolitionist um, uh, warrior John Brown, who was uh, a white man who was trying his best to um, help free enslaved peoples who was um, tried, convicted, and then later hung. And so uh, Horace Pippin is, you know, is painting this scene of this man who's, you know, being carted to the, the tree here and about to be strung up and, and hung and all the onlookers who are watching, all of which who are also white, right? Um, as, a, as a way of sort of showing who's in charge here and, and what happens to people who violate the status quo. I think it's, well, well, you know, maybe we'll stop here because on Thursday I do want to talk, however, briefly about uh, the portrait that Horace Pippin did of George Washington, which is the subject of that, that painting, which I think is also very interesting because often... Well, you know, let, I'll, I'll save everything I got to say for that episode. So let's uh, let's march on here and look at the next step. I don't think I need to do any underpainting um, because most of the details here I think are, are relatively easy for us to find. So let's instead go right to the background and begin painting the background. So, the sky there is basically a cool blue, and we've got these white clouds. Now, if we just zoom in really quickly, we can see that underneath this blue paint, we've got something kind of, this is the aim, aim amateur, or probably more likely the wood or cardboard, that is, or this is canvas. That's canvas texture for sure. So, but it looks like this canvas might have been painted brown. So it looks, it's probably likely that he, he did an Empremitura on this painting. But it's, so the way that what he's done is taken that brown and probably painted some of these lines. Um, and then he's gone over and painted it with a cool blue and those clouds. So let's just do exactly what the master himself did. And let's start mixing up our paint. So... Let's get started here. So what I'll do, I'm going to take some white. And then I'm going to take a little bit of blue. Remember, the, the blue is going to really transform this white very quickly. So it's always easier to start with a little. So you see how I kind of, kind of start here. And then if I need more, I bring a little bit more into my mixture. And if I need more, I bring a little bit more into my mixture. That way, I'm not uh, starting with a big gob of, of the blue and then having to kind of add more and more white. 
I did just add more white there because I was a little, I'm a little afraid I won't have enough paint to cover the whole surface. That's pretty close. Maybe just a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to start with this. I think that it's possible that, you know, I haven't added any medium, so this is going to be full strength, but it's possible that this yellow might cause this color to darken down a little bit anyway. So I want to make sure, you know, it's easier if I can just do this once and I don't have to do a second coat. Although I might have to, we'll see. We'll see how much this covers. Ah. So you can see I'm also using a big brush to do this. I'm not getting stuck using tiny brushes first thing into this painting. I want to start big. And I don't care if I'm a little bit sloppy and I paint over some lines. In fact, I'd prefer that. Because then it's less likely to have that yellow coming through. Again, notice how kind of, you know, it's not too precise here. It's not, not the goal of this stage of painting. Okay, so now I just, um, I'm going to, I'm just going to move on. It is possible, well, let me see, maybe should I just do the whole sky right now? You know what, maybe I'll do that. Let's just get the sky done. I'm, I am going to blow dry this. Uh, so that I can do another coat of blue right now. So I'm just going to blow dry that. Okay, so let's, I'm going to mix this up again. Now, because I've painted it on there, probably need less paint just because the surface is getting smoother and smoother each time. So now this time, let's see if we can maybe mix this color even closer. Ooh, that went a little bit dark there. That's okay. I just want to make sure that if I do go darker like that, that I get the, all of the paint on my brush also to go darker so I don't have lighter paint stuck in there. 
Okay, let's do this again. Another thing about painting with a little bit more thick paint like this is that, oops, I see there's a little bit of white guy in there, is if it's a little bit thicker, it's easier to kind of blend that in if you've got a couple different colors, if you're, especially if you're painting a little bit quicker like this. It does look lighter than the original, but in person, I think I've got it right. Like on camera, the, the, it is a little bit brighter. I, I have brightened the brightness up on the camera just to, so that the darker areas don't quite appear so dark on camera. So I think that's pretty good. Also, you know, if I, I always kind of feel like if I, it's better maybe to air a little bit on the side of a little bit lighter for the background so that anything that's darker in the foreground will really pop forward. Okay. So we do have the clouds. I might just wait for that just to kind of dry a little bit before I move on. I think while that's happening, I might do this grass down here quickly. You know, this is technically not the background. This is really foreground, but for our purpose, I might get that in right here real quick. So what we want to do here is warm colors. So we want to take a warm green and put this in place. So to get a warm green, we're going to take our warm yellow, put this down here, I, just, I need more warm yellow. We start kind of small. You just be careful about going too dark too quickly. Okay. So while that's not maybe as dark as I ultimately want to go, I'm going to start with something like this. Because we may end up actually painting a little bit of a slightly cooler colors um, over top of this. So I just want to, I don't want it to maybe go too dark too quickly.
Remember I was saying that that signature probably just going to disappear. Well, there it goes. So again, that's not the, the final color that we're going to put in there for the for the grass, but it establishes a kind of a good um, warm base because I think it's possible that I haven't even looked. Yeah, this looks like it's going to be a cooler blue. It goes over top of here. So that's going to, uh, again, cool colors want to recede. So if we just put a bunch of cool colors right here, it's going to have this weird thing where the background wants to kind of go, or the, this grass in the foreground wants to go backwards and so we want to keep pull it up by using some warmer colors underneath that cool blue cool green that will eventually go there and in fact I think right now I'm gonna paint there's this kind of cool teal color of this hill that's going in behind here so I'm gonna paint that there next and I think you'll just start to see a little bit of the difference between what that color would look like on its own versus what it would look like on top of this. So I'm just going to clean my brush here. And there's Judy says, hi, following and painting with Michael for about 18 months now, but this is my first live stream. That's awesome. Welcome. Oh, and Deborah says, Maud Lewis. Yes, thank you. <laughs> That's uh, the other so called outsider artist, the Canadian outsider artist. Right, and also outsider artists and folk artists both tend to be people of color and women, right? Or at least that term is often applied to them. And in many, much fewer occasions is it actually white men that are known as folk artists. And if there are white men that have been called folk artists or primitive artists, often they're people who have some sort of physical or mental challenge. Um, and so, are, whereas women and people of color who were otherwise functional members of society but just didn't happen to go to art school were described as a folk artist or an outsider artist so again i just it's i think that's i just want to emphasize why i think those those terms are, are quite problematic um, to this day so let's mix our cool green now and i'm just going to use a smaller brush and i'm going to paint right into to this uh color i've already pre-mixed here so i'm going to take my Cool blue and my cool yellow and there's this white in here right so it looks like there's actually a little bit more blue Let's continue this. So 
So that's higher than his original hillside. The reason why it went up higher is because I noticed there's a few places where I forgot the blue in here. So I was just like, you know what, let's just raise that hillside. We'll, uh, the blue sky, we'll just pretend like it was always meant to be there. And that's okay. Now I'm just going to take a smaller brush. Okay, now I'm just wondering, should I make these pointy up here? No, I think that's okay. Okay, again, not exactly the right color, but... Um, Good enough for right now. So let's uh, quickly blow dry this, and then I think I might go down. Well, I might do another little coat of this, and then paint the grass down here, or at least the next part of it. Uh, Sandra says, how did you know about the historical landmark, Michael? Uh, I don't know, it just came up in the research, I guess. Time that I could should probably be using to spend working on my graphic novel. That I, I mean, I love history, and I love reading about history, so it's one of those things where I sometimes just fall down these rabbit holes of information. So, man, this grass is interesting. Let's. Now, I wonder. Whoa! Okay, so I'm not going to do all of that. It does look like. Well, hmm. You can see that he. Yeah, it looks like each one of these is an individual little blade of grass that he painted. Wow, not gonna do that. 
Um, in fact, yeah. So I think what I'm gonna do, let's. I'm gonna start painting with some white over top of things here. I'm just gonna actually quickly blow dry that. My uh, my father in particular is a big history buff, so that's where I got my interest in history, which I'm grateful for because I find history just so fascinating. I think it makes contemporary life fascinating when you're aware of what happened before, and the context for everything, and nothing happens in a vacuum, so... Um, okay, so what I want to do next is I want to start. I'm going to paint the clouds and the the wooden fence here. And you know, if I do just sort of look, you know, if I really wanted to get super authentic, what I could consider doing is even painting a little bit of. In fact, maybe do I want to do this? Let's let's have a little bit of fun. Okay, so what I see here, I don't know about you, but I see almost like a little bit of, well, there looks like a little bit of brown there, maybe a little bit of purple. So I'm just going to make a little bit of purple. This isn't really there, and, and maybe I'm just hallucinating or something, but why not just to add a little bit of this fun color underneath in a few places? I think it's going to make this sky much more dynamic. So I'm going to take my, in fact, maybe that might be a little bit dark, so let's just take a bit of white. zoom into the sky. This does just add a little bit to my timeline, but I think we can, it's always kind of fun just to play with uh, a few different techniques and, um, you know, sometimes like if, if an idea occurs to you, it's, uh, why not run with it for a little bit? And, I mean, worse comes to worse. You're not happy with what you've done, and you just paint over it. I mean, the great thing with painting is there's so little at stake that if things don't go your way, it's not like uh, it's the end of the line for you. You just move on and you live to paint again. 
And it almost looks like there's a little bit of that in the flowers too, doesn't it? Now I could probably have just outlined these lines, but that would have taken me probably just about as long as it has taken me just to do what I've just done here, so. Okay, so now I'm just debating to myself if I should do the flowers with this purple like that. Huh. Well, maybe let's do purple, but let's let's just let's give it a bit more red. Why not? Oops. So it's going to take a little bit more of my. Remember, I said I'm probably not going to use much cool red. Well, here I'm using most of it right here. So, and if we don't like it, remember, no big deal. Now, is this what he did? I have no idea. I, I probably not. Um, But you know, I've ne I've never done a painting, at least for our class, like this. Approached it in quite this way. So for me, that's kind of cool. It's doing something different. Let's go up here like that. Okay. <laughs> it's again. It's always one of those things where I I just wonder people who are just tuning in for the first time are like, wow, this guy's colorblind. Doesn't he know that those are yellow daffodils? Like, the guy's lost his mind. Which is, which is also likely. <laughs> um, if we just look at them side by side. Maybe, let's, let's see, maybe while we're right here, what color should we, if we're just going to keep doing the silliness, or what is under, oh, it looks, okay, so we see there's some green underneath here. That's a really dark kind of purple over top of this. So it's almost like he painted the green and then did purple over top of it. Um, so let's get, let's take... I'm going to take this green 
and maybe let's, uh, which way should we go? Should we go lighter or darker? Let's take some of our cool blue and mix that in here. Just get a bit more of that electric color. I think it's always important to remember that with the vast majority of artworks, an artist doesn't know exactly what it's going to look like until the painting is done. So often artists are applying many different layers of colors and then painting them out because they decide that you know, a different color would be more appropriate. So it is quite possible that like everything we're doing right now is exactly what he did and the reason why we got he got some of those kind of effects that I'm trying to recreate here um, is because it's the result of just the thinking the thought process here of just sort of changing his mind putting a different color here or there Okay, again, we'll look at them side by side. Okay, let's, that's pretty good. Let's clean this brush and I forgot those rocks down there too. Let's just. That's also there's some kind of there's some color underneath this white, another kind of purple. So maybe let's take let's do the same thing. Let's take some of this blue. We're just gonna make this maybe a little bit more bluish purple. Like, I think what's interesting to me is that Horse Pippin, after being included in that exhibition by the Museum of Modern Art, after that exhibition tours the country and turns him into a major celebrity, that's when he has the first opportunity to take an actual art class. So that, that's got to be kind of like an interesting sort of footnote in, in history is like, you have your first exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art and then you start taking art classes. But also good on him, like the amount of humility that would take to to go into an art class after 
you know, you, everyone would be like, what are you doing here? You're already, like, on the cover of magazines and newspapers. Why are you taking art classes? Like, I, just, I think I can get better. I, I don't really feel that confident, like, I know that much, so I really want to learn. Like, oh, that's interesting. You know, it's like, uh, I just think that just shows, like, a commitment to, to growth and, um, a lot of humility. Sandra says, uh, "Cool, LOL, cool red has been my favorite color lately. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I mean, I think it's, maybe it's just some weird unconscious bias I have towards paintings that have less cool red in the background for whatever reason. Um, uh, although, interestingly enough, like, magenta is like the, the, the primary color used in the printing process, CMYK is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. K for chromatic black. Um, so CMYK is the are the four colors that are used in the, um, the the printing process. And so magenta is used rather than let's say a cadmium red. Or so so essentially. What you can see there is we have three cool colors that are used to... Uh, so we have a cool blue, cyan. We've got a, a cool red, which is magenta. And the yellow is a cool yellow plus black. And those three colors are used to create um, a lot... Well, and plus black are used to create, quote-unquote, the entire color spectrum. But anybody who's ever done any designing on the computer knows that CMYK, the palette is... is really limited you can create a beautiful image on your computer screen and then you go to export it to print and then it comes out kind of dull and doesn't have quite as many bright colors it's because they're only using four colors if they were using a much more expanded palette like we've got here with warm and cool colors then they would be able to print anything and you'd be able to have these beautiful full colored images Sandra says, Pippin is my hero. Awesome. I love to hear that. A really cool fellow, for sure. You, you, that's a, he's a good person to, to, uh, to be cheering for, for sure. Okay. I think I, think I might leave this right here. And, and maybe I'm going to take a moment to uh, look at the dog. So maybe I'm just going to separate these. I should, maybe I should have done this earlier, but... So I've painted a lot of the painting, and I think now it's time to take a look at the dog in the foreground, even though I've kind of already painted some foreground elements already. So, um, what do we need to do for this dog? Do we, what, is there any colors we see underneath here? Hmm. So what I think I'm going to do is pick this lighter brown color. And then we're going to do some white over top of it. And we can do some darker brown over top of it. So, uh, and that's going to be a warmer brown. So let's... this right here. Actually, I'm a bit more yellow. So we start out by mixing an orange. And then we're going to take a little bit of blue. So that's pretty close, but we also want some white in here.
That's good. Okay, we'll preserve the rest of that paint. And good. I'm feeling great about where I'm at with this painting. So I think I'll blow dry this now. And then what should we do next? Maybe I'll go to the clouds. I'll start painting some white in here because I want to paint. I got to paint the white of the clouds, the white of the fence, the white of the rocks, and then I'm going to start painting kind of a almost white yellow that will go well. Well, we'll see. Well, I wonder how much yellow we'll put in those flowers. Ideally, it'd be great if we could just do one pass, but I think we'll have to do two coats of of that yellow. So let's blow dry this here real quick. Okay, so let's uh, dive in. Where did... The paintbrush has disappeared on me. I must have blown it away somewhere. What? How did that happen? Is that it? I thought it was a darker brush in this. Hmm. Well, I have officially lost my mind. Maybe maybe this was it. Was I not? Okay. So let's um let's go to the white up here. And We'll start painting with this way. I'm almost tempted to put a little bit of glazing fluid or matte medium in here to make this white more transparent. But I think that would just mean I would have to do another separate coat of white again, potentially afterwards. And I don't think we need, I think we should be able to be fine with this. Okay. So what I want to do here is just leave you know, a little halo of that purple in places. Yeah, I'm kind of glad I didn't do uh, put any medium in here because this is all it's still. This is transparent enough that I might even have to go back over top of this. So this just gives things a very different kind of look than if we had just painted white into the clouds here and had just called that a day, right? Because um, now we've got a little bit of that darker color kind of coming through and infusing this these clouds with a little bit of that darkness. 
kind of makes them a little bit gray. Now, I am going to go back over top of this later on with some more white, I think, probably. And we can just decide like how, you know, I mean, I, I could, for instance, I could paint over top of this in many ways and hide those edges if I wanted. It sort of defeat the purpose of having painted them in the first place, but. Okay, that's good. Let's go to the fence now. Actually, let's paint. This is, I think, kind of probably the fastest way that I can think of to kind of get this stuff done and for it to look reasonably clean. And now we could have painted the white and then tried to paint this green around these white shapes, but just imagine how kind of difficult that would be, how time consuming it would be, and probably also a little bit sloppy too, because you've got all these little tiny brush strokes that have to get around into these small corners whereas instead we could just brush it with a big solid area
So I'll probably have to do another little coat of this, potentially. I mean, it's not, it's a little bit transparent, which I don't mind, but it's a little, his is very opaque. He's, he's painting with pretty thick, opaque layers of paint, so to try to get kind of close to the way that he painted, I think we want to maybe do another layer. I guess that hill behind there could have been darker. It's kind of a little bit... I guess it's not too late, but it would be a real pain in the butt to try to fix that now. So let's just back out. Okay, let's go back down again. Take a look at the rocks. See how he's sort of like outlining these here? It is interesting he's, I mean, this is, what he's done here is a very interesting strategy. Um, I mean, it's pretty clear that he's doing something pretty close to what I, I'm doing right now. And I, I can't really think of too many artists who used, did something like that. Um, it's certainly not like a traditional classical way of painting but the results you know kind of speak for themselves they're pretty cool so um i mean that's one of my favorite re reasons for doing these episodes is you just see a completely different way of painting and you're welcome to kind of take it or leave it embrace it do something new i mean who knows but it's you know it's uh just a good reminder that there's sort of infinite ways of doing what we're doing right now. And, you know, what somebody else's bad technique is can be somebody else's um, genius, innovative approach, right? Just might need a little bit of 
you know, somebody like Horace Pippin to devote part of their career to establishing it and mining it for new new ground. Okay. I wonder, do I want to paint the clouds and everything again or go into the daffodils? Maybe I'm going to blow dry this and then I'll paint the daffodils and then that I'll, that because I just don't want to get my hand and smudge all this around here. So let's just mute. To paint the daffodils, we're going to want to use, uh, we're going to probably have to do a couple coats of this, so just like we're doing with everything else. So I'm just going to take some white, because I want mostly white here, and some yellow, just put a bit of yellow in here. We don't want to put too much yellow, because yellow is kind of transparent, so the more yellow we put in there, the thinner and more transparent this paint will be. Meaning I might have to do this a few times. Whereas if I can kind of get that close the first time. Or not close, but cover up some of that purple. You know, it's not going to go totally dark. Because you can see what happened here previously. So. You know, again, like this kind of thing, you know, requires a little bit more time. And so part of it's like, well, why, why go to all this extra effort when the painting is going to look, you know, if we just painted this yellow to begin with and didn't paint the purple underneath the clouds and all that kind of stuff, we'd be, you know, much closer. We'd probably be 45 minutes closer to being done at this point. Um, but it's not always about being getting it done as quickly as possible. 
All right, if you'll recall, we, we looked at the great Japanese contemporary artist, Yayoi Kasuma, who's one of my all-time favorite artists. And, you yeah, know, I'm not alone. She's probably you know, one of the most successful living artists. Um, but she explained she goes out of her way to make paintings that take a long time because her art practice is part of her mental health practice. And so she's in no hurry to finish a painting because as soon as she finishes a painting, she's got to start another one. So that's why she does like all these thousands of little tiny dots on her paintings because she says that when she's painting, all the voices in her head disappear and she's able to kind of have some relief. So for her... You know, the idea of trying to get the painting done as quickly as possible so you can do other things in life doesn't make any sense to her whatsoever. She's more than happy taking her time. And I just find that very inspiring. And it's a good reminder that that it's the journey, not the destination, that's so important. right? And if you're enjoying the act of painting, then if you end up with a good painting at the end, that's great. If not, that's okay. As long as you enjoyed that experience, that's what we're going for. Okay, so let's now... You know, I am wondering maybe I should paint this dark area in here. Well, no, I'm going to paint the clouds. Uh, let's go back to that area. Let's finish that. Oops. Uh, Deborah says, I've actually been painting along with Michael right up until this point, and I'm very tired, and I'm going off to, to do my yoga, and then off to bed. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Good night, Deborah. I'll be finished tomorrow. Hugs. Um, Sandra says, Good night, Deb. Happy birthday. Oh, I didn't know it was your birthday. Who's, who's happy birthdays? And there's Brig Hearn says, Hello from Florida. So happy I saw that you're on tonight. Hello, Big Hearn. Brig Hearn, sorry. Down in Florida. Well, I was going to say, well, it is, I'm sure it's much warmer in Florida than it is here in Vancouver today. Although it was really sunny, deceptively cold. It's one of those days you look at, like, wow, let's break out the flip flops and go for, a, and then you open the door, like, woo, that's cold. It's much colder than I thought it was going to be. So, um,. But then I lived for a quarter of my life down in Los Angeles, where, you know, it would get so hot that I'd be complaining to my friends who'd be like, listen, complaining about how hot it is uh, in Los Angeles while we're all up here in Calgary and Toronto and Vancouver. And it's like freezing cold. Yeah, we don't really have much sympathy. But you'd have to explain to people how like how hot it could be. You know, sometimes it would get up to like a hundred, hundred and ten. You know, which is like forty degrees, forty-five degrees Celsius. And ooh, I don't think people are supposed to <laughs> to to live in such warm climates. It's like kind of unbearable. You, know, you wake up and then you and you wake wake up in your bed and you're sweaty in bed because I never had air conditioning um, when I lived down there. But you wake up hot and you jump in the shower, get ready for work while you on your way walking to the car, you, you're now dripping in sweat and you feel like turning around and going back inside and having another shower. It's like... So... I always saw this... It reminded me a lot of being... Growing up in Canada in the, in the winters, you know, when you're just like running from warm place to warm place in the winter. When it gets hot, it's like the exact opposite. 
you're like running from air conditioning to air conditioning place. And all of your judgments about, you know, where to go for dinner and stuff. But do they have air conditioning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand it's good that that chef was on whatever show last week. But I mean, do they have air conditioning? Because <laughs> if not, uh, I would prefer to... I'll go to McDonald's instead. I don't know if I can deal with this. You know, potentially, too, we could have even saved... I might have even... Well, I don't know if it would save time, but I could have just painted all of this, that green, and just painted white over top of the green. Um, I would, you know, it's one of those things where whenever I try to, like, come up with a solution that I think is going to save me some time, inevitably it takes me the same, exact same amount of time. You know, it's like, uh, when you're standing in line at the grocery store and then you get this, you're like, okay, I'm in the long line. Wh wh okay, which line? Oh, oh, look, there's one guy who's got two things. Okay, I'm going to get out and you get in that line. And then that's the guy that has the price check or wants to write a check. You know, it's just like, you know what? As I've gotten older, it's just like, you know, let's just stand in this line. Because as soon as I get out of this line, it's going to just go really fast. <laughs> this is the law of... Uh, of lines. The law of lines is the, the line you're in is always the slowest line. And as soon as you get out of the fast line, the line that you're in becomes the slowest line. All right, that's the second law of of uh, line dynamics. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that that uh, was first theorized by uh, Sir Isaac Newton. I I'm pretty sure. Now, you know, it probably would have been nice... I could have just modified... Instead of just painting a bunch of white here... I probably could have added a little bit of color. I could see all of these rocks being purples and like a rainbow color. I think that that could be kind of cool right here. Um, that could be fun. But I want to try to just paint the painting as the master himself did it. Okay, getting there. Okay, let's, um, what should I do next? Should I do the daffodils or maybe, let's save the daffodils for a few minutes. Let's do the grass down here. I think that would be good. <laughs> yeah, Brighorn says, the weather down here in Florida is nice this time of year, but summers are another story. <laughs> yes. I haven't been, I've been to Florida, I think, well, at least once. I went there with my family when I was maybe eight or nine years old. Um, I'd love to go back. There's a lot of things I'd like to do down there. Mm-hmm. I got a whole bunch of this um, oat 
eggnog on sale at Whole Foods. And now, so I've got every, all of my, my milk is, uh, eggnog, oat, oat-based eggnog. My, uh, yeah, my cream and my teas, which is, I don't know, I love eggnog. I know not everybody will, and here it's the middle of February and I'm drinking eggnog, but I think it's time that we liberate eggnog from its holiday, uh, uh, connection right we should be able to drink eggnog in summer and in the fall and in spring i let's start a petition because eggnog is delicious even if there's really no eggs or nog in this vegan eggnog uh anyway let's paint the grass what should we do here so this is a very dark color. In fact, I think what we're going to do is we'll mix a black and then we're going to add color to that. So um, since we haven't really talked about black thus far, I think it's time we have that conversation. Looks like I got, I might have enough. Okay, so let's do this. So... To make a black, what we want to do is we're going to mix a yellow, a blue, and a red together. Not just any color, though. What we're going to start by doing is we're going to take our cool yellow and our cool blue and mix a green. All right, so we get this nice saturated green. And then what we're going to do is mix it with our warm red. So we've got two cool colors, we're mixing it with a warm color. And by doing that, it's going to pull this green into the neutral core. And so it's going to cancel. So the green's going to cancel out the red and the red's going to cancel out the green. Now, this is not the easiest thing to do. Obviously, we could just use our own. We could just take black. I've got a black here, but I always think it's it's very helpful for us to learn how to mix our own blacks uh, because then we can get really nuanced blacks that aren't just black, 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 but purple black or green black or orangey black or you know lots of different kinds so if you struggle to get a, a perfect black that's okay it doesn't have to be perfect in fact i that's one of the reasons why i like mixing my own black is because i can kind of get something that's a little bit um you know that that's doesn't come in a tube So the other thing too is when you you mix, you basically want about 33% of each one of these. And then you kind of mix it together. It can be very hard to determine when you're just looking at this, like what is that? Is that a green or purple or brown, right? So one of your secrets is, is you can use a little bit of white to tell. Now I can already see that this is a bit more on the green side of things. So what does that mean? If it's really green what do i need to add to it to make it go black uh red right remember it was so this is it's kind of like it's near the here but we need to pull it in here so let's get more red now i mean, might not use that whole blob so let's just put that to the side and that's better now we're killing off that green Potentially might have gone a little too far to the red. Maybe I put a bit too much in there. In which case, if we did too much red, then we'd want to go back with a little bit more blue and and uh, um, yellow. I think that's pretty good, though. So now we've got our black. Which one should we do first? Should we do the grass or the plants in here because i see kind of two slightly different colors this here looks maybe a little bit more on the really dark purpley side in fact maybe there's some purple and then almost like a black over top of it versus here it's like just a really dark green okay i think i've got two solutions in mind the first one, I think for the, what I'm going to do for the, I, 
I'm going to take, I'm going to take this black and I'm going to put it in here with my cool red and my warm blue. So now I've got like a really, really dark purple. I like that color. And I'm going to paint that in and around here. So let's just take a look because it's hard to really see how he, what he's doing here. My first instinct is just to completely cover this. But I think what I'm going to do instead is sort of just paint kind of like lines and things in here so that we have I can't really see I'm going to paint kind of a really dark green in here as well. really dark in these areas but I, I, I don't think it's necessarily important that that we get it all right but just understanding that what he's doing here is rather than just doing a big blob of paint he's painting details in here so what that does is it just tells us as viewers that that there's more to what there's there's more to what we in, might initially see at first glance He's trying to encourage us to take that extra little second to look closer. Right, to get up close. To take that second look. And I think that's what all artists kind of ultimately want, is that you kind of, it kind of stops you in your tracks and you kind of have to look more deeply and Okay, so let's take that and let's um let's do this again. Let's take our cool blue this time. And our cool red or cool it's a cool 
cool blue and cool yellow. Well, actually, that's not bad. I was going to say, is that too dark? But I think this is going to be just barely different enough that we're going to get similar sort of effect to what Pippin did on his. There's Oh Ho Ho One. Hey, how you doing, Mark? Very good. Very good. Or or Michael is, is uh, a lot of people call me Mark, but, but my, my name is Michael. I hear it all the time from my students and teachers. It's a common mistake because my last name is Mark Kowski, so a lot of people will say, hey, Mark. I'm so used to it that uh, it never phases me or bothers me, but it always just... It's worth just uh, pointing it out. Because there's, there's been a, there are still a few people, actually, who've been calling me Mark for like a decade, and I don't have the heart to, to correct them. <laughs> So you can see it's not quite as dark as the previous layer, so that's why I can even just sort of paint over top of some of that purple. I might even go back over top of it in a few places with the purple again. I really like the way this looks. Now it's very subtle. It's probably a little bit more obvious on camera than it is in uh, on the real painting here. Just because again the color is... I've brightened everything up so that you can see what I'm doing in some of the darker areas of these paintings. So let's just take a look. Good. Okay. I'm happy with the way that's turning out. So let's uh, let's leave that for a moment and just check out rest of the painting. So this color, I think what I'm going to do now is actually paint the color that we used for the hill in the background. A similar version of it, not maybe with as much white, all over top of this area down here. So let's um, that's the color, but let's take a bit more cool blue into this mixture here. Thank you. 
Oops, sorry. It's a nice color and so that color we get this kind of neat color because it's we're painting over top of that warm color that was once there and so you can see that the the maybe the slight difference between a very similar color that were that we had up here and behind the fence and the color that I'm painting with now the difference is, is that this that that color was just over top of the warm yellow and here's over top of the darker warm green and that really is oof that's a beautiful color i like that a lot Like what's cool is it it almost it appears to be kind of glowing right and that's because we've got that warmer color underneath trying to poke through this cooler color over top Ooh, that is beautiful i like you know, it's when you sometimes you see that and you're just like, oh, I don't know, do I want to do a darker color over top of that? That is such a beautiful color. I think I will, but I just, it's also just sometimes, you're like, oh, hmm, tempted. Tempted to leave it. Trying to, I, I did have a really big book from the library of Horace Pippin's art. Um, I scanned most of it. Um, I just wanted to see if I maybe I still had it. It has a, a self-portrait of Horace Pippin right on the front cover. Now Pippin, what is is that? Is there is that Lord of the Rings? Is there a Pippin? Lord of the Rings. There's got to be a uh, someone who's a Lord of the Rings fan watching. I think it's it's Pippin, or is that Hobbit? Pippin. It's been a couple decades since I read the Lord of the Rings, or saw the movies, I guess. Hmm. I love that color. Woo, that is... I mean, it's... Yeah, it would be weird just to leave it like that. Um, but it is... And it, maybe it doesn't quite come across on camera very well, but it is... It's got a... It's a, it's a really deep, intense teal color. I think, you know, it's still wet, so it's pro that's also probably hindering the way it looks on camera. And probably these two look very similar on camera. This just looks, you know, there's a lot more white in this, and it just looks a little bit, wait, it looks more dull, because white will make a color look dull. But this, it just got the, this such an interesting glow. I mean, I'm, I remember in art school, you know, you'd have teachers just talk about how you know, part of the goal of, of painting is to make something that kind of defies proper photo documentation. It's just like you got to see it in person. It just doesn't quite come across as well in, on camera. I think that's kind of an instance where that's happening. Okay. Oh, I wanted to do the little bits of grass coming up. These little fellas there. So let's just take the same color we've just been painting with. Should 
Let's get some. Even smaller brush here. I just want to check the um, so this painting is 13 and uh, what is it 13 okay so 14 inches by 10 inches so not actually too much bigger than what we're talking about this is a my canvas is a 12, 9 by 12, and his was a 10 by 14. So I was going to say, wow, he's, you know, he's doing a lot of great detail, but his painting is so much bigger than mine. And then you're like, wow, actually, not really. <laughs> he's, look how much detail. Ugh, you see, that's, you know, that's very impressive that he's able to do. I mean, that's, this is some pretty intense brush control here. Especially when we look at, it looks like almost the entire bottom part of the painting, all of that grass, that is all done with little tiny brush strokes. Now, I don't have the patience to do that, so I'm not going to do it, but uh, it is um, something to be said for that. <laughs> Rick says Pippin, short for Peregrine Took, is one of the fellows is from is one of the Fellowship of the Ring. Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> I have some very serious Lord of the Rings fans who would be in horror that I read all of the books. Watch the movies with them and don't remember. It's just like, what is wrong with you? In one ear, out the other. Ugh, disgusting. <laughs> I'm really bad with... I, I, I tend to just remember the things that I'm most interested in and everything else goes out. One of my favorite quotes of all time is a Sherlock Holmes, Sher, is a Sherlock Holmes quote by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, of course, but... Um, Watson is talking about, uh, the latest research on astronomy and about the discovery, maybe it was of like Pluto at the time. And, and he goes on this long, maybe a couple of pages talking about 
space and Holmes listens intently. Interesting, interesting. And then when he finishes, he's like, well, that's fascinating. And I shall do my best to forget everything you just said. Watson's like, what? How rude. Are, like, what, what kind of person says that? Uh, Sherlock, you, you, you've learned some manners. And Sherlock is like, well, the brain is like an attic. There's only so many boxes you can put in there. Every once in a while, you just got to clean space and make room for other thoughts and memories. I've, I don't think the brain actually works like that, but it always stuck in my mind as sort of an interesting um, approach to things. Sherlock, of course, is always maybe... You know, maybe uh, socially inept. I think maybe is the generous way of saying, saying that. Anyway, um, okay. Well, how are we doing? Okay, where's where's the clock? Ooh, okay, so let's let's pick up the pace here. Um, now, now you can see the sky does look much lighter. I th well, in person, it, it it is a little bit lighter. Uh, but not quite as light as it appears on camera. Now, I, it's it's too late, really. I mean, I could paint it, but that would, it would take me a while to get it kind of nice and unified as it is right now, having to paint around all that. So, let's... I think it's time to do our daffodils. I'm going to blow dry everything here. I'm just going to, let's do another little title card here so I can break this show up into a few spots. Okay, I think, um, so we've got a lot of this painting done. Really, the main things we've got left are the daffodils themselves, the grass, and the dog. Um, otherwise, I'm pretty satisfied with where everything else is and where, where we're at there. Uh, it's just a matter of like, what should we do first? What should we do last? Um, maybe let's do the dog now. We haven't really touched the dog much at all, so I think it's time that uh, we give it some attention. Um, I would be super interested to know what kind of dog, what breed of dog that is. If anyone is an expert at dog breeds, please let me know. I'd be interested to know. It's like some sort of like sheepdog or something, isn't it? Um, so now what we, we we've got this coat of paint here. We can now either go darker or lighter. Uh, I think probably I'll go uh, and I, I might actually go lighter and darker and lighter again and darker again. So it doesn't really matter so much. Um, let's say let's go lighter. So let's take some white and maybe just a little bit of this paint here. Okay. And just going to scrape that paint off. Kathy says, hi everyone, I'm late, but I'm here now. It's an afternoon movie with Hubby for Valentine's. <laughs> okay, 
let's zoom in. Rigorn says maybe some sort of spaniel. That makes sense, yeah. And it's hard to tell, like, how big of a dog this actually is. Like, is this, you know, because the daffodils are big. The painting is, after all, called giant daffodils. Um, so are these, like, big? Did, like, did, did daffodils come that big? Or is this just a very small dog in front of a very small or from a large plant like is the plant this big and then you've got a tiny little baby dog or is this like huge daffodil petals and a big dog i don't know you you let me know what you think um I, this dog does you know this looks like an older dog you know this looks like a dog that is Quite happy just to sit here all day long and be painted. It's... And you know what? I'm going to take a bit of my glazing fluid here. I'm going to put this into my paint. It's going to make that paint more fluid and easier to paint with. The drawback is, is that it's going to be a little bit more transparent. Um, now I'm painting with white, and white is very opaque, so it's going to help... And it won't be as transparent than, let's say, if I was painting with yellow or red or anything. But it makes a huge difference. So as this dries, it's going to get, um, it's going to lose some of its opacity and get kind of darker, which suits me just fine. And then we can go back over certain areas and kind of lighten them up more or darken them or whatever we want to do.
So now, technically, he's doing something very similar to the all of this grass around here. Now that is a commitment. To do that, that would take a couple of hours probably for me to do that. So I'm not going to do all of these tiny little lines. I might do a bit of them though. We'll see. I mean, I do like the way this painting is turning out, so, you know, sometimes when the painting's going well, I'm like, ah, eh, let's just see it through. But, uh, again, it's a commitment. So let's take this same color, let's darken this. So that was the color I was just painting with. This is the original color. I want something that's just a little bit in between them. I'm just going to go back to, oh, I don't really have much of that original color left, do I? I'm going to go, let's take some of this opposite way here. Let's make another brown. Let's take our warm yellow, warm blue. Let's take a bit more warm blue. And warm red. It's going to give us a darker brown. The more blue we put in here, the darker that will be. This might be probably enough though, so. You know, again, I'm going to put a little bit of, oops. matte medium, or sorry, a glazing fluid in there. That's just going to make it a little bit thinner, a little easier to paint with. This is, you know, this is the kind of thing that maybe other people would use water for. The thing is, is that water is going to just be maybe a little bit too thin, and this at least kind of helps keep it like the the strength of these lines together and the adherence of it all to the to the canvas
I mean, just as I, what I'm thinking about as I'm painting this painting is just like, wow, this is not easy to do. These, he's painting on a canvas is just a little bit bigger than mine. And the amount of precision he has is something that, that is not easy for me to do. Or just, rec I'm, I'm just a little bit more impatient. Um, so just a good reminder that like, Again, you know, what I was saying earlier about, um, you know, there's this idea of, like, outsider art, um, primitive art as being made by people who are, uh, by men, or by, by women and people of color, usually is how that term is used, and as a way to dismiss them, as, that they're not, quote-unquote, like, real artists. And because they never went to a real, quote-unquote, art school. And yet, like, the amount of brush control involved in a making artwork like this is, is it's, it's pretty intense. Like, to do it really well, like all these little lines, it's not, it's, it's something that even, like, a really skilled artist could, you know... Uh, would take them a while to do it as well, so I find it just very impressive. Okay, let's take a little bit of our darker color. in here and just get a darker darker brown I wonder if that's going to be too dark I just looked up at the original, like, whoa, I guess I kind of goofed on the spots or the patterning. I'm going to put a little bit of glazing fluid back in here again. All this paint has been drying out over the past little while.
Alright, and that the eye of that dog also looks to get darker here. So let's just take some darker paint. Basically my black. I'll wait for that to dry a little bit. Okay, while that's doing its thing, how am I doing for time? Okay, I'd like to wrap up in about a half an hour, so. Kathy says, uh, that's what I thought. Two brig, a large breed of spaniel. This dog could be. So now with these uh, daffodils, we're going to take some, this is going to be kind of a combination of, of both our warm and cool colors, I think. Uh, so we could take some of, actually, you know what, maybe it's just going to be mostly, let's just see. Yeah, maybe that's it. Okay. Let's take a little bit of red though, because we're going to do a little bit of orange in a few places. So as I paint, I'm going to be kind of dipping back in from like uh, the orangey red to just the, or sorry, the orangey yellow to just regular yellow here. I'm just going to take a bit of cool yellow and put this in here too because I don't want them to be too, yeah, I think that's a little bit better. always easier to darken a color than it is to lighten it so if I use more of that cool yellow to start and then I want to come back and make it a little bit warmer a little bit more orangey that's really easy to do just by painting those colors right on there but if I go too dark then I might have to add white in there and to lighten it up and then it kind of sets me back and I have to kind of start that process over again at least in that area So this is mostly just, oh, sorry, I didn't, uh, none of that was on camera. Let's just bounce back. There we go. Okay, so now I'm going to go back here with my warm um, red and warm yellow. Just little accents. Okay. 
Now I think I might just do, a, I could do a little bit of glazing on there to kind of put a little bit of outlines on here. So I'll do that. I'll wait for this all to dry here first, however. While that's drying, definitely needs to get darker there's a lot of little blades of grass in here Horace I don't know if I'm gonna I'm up, up for that um, let's blow dry this take all of my warm blue I'm just gonna mix it into this green which was mostly warm yellow let's fact let's take a bit more warm yellow in here I'm also gonna take just a little bit of my cool blue maybe I'll take just a bit more. That's a beautiful, nice, dark green. Is it? No, I think that's good. Yeah. I could go darker, but I like that. It's also, it's definitely, it's got a nice green quality that maybe we don't have quite so much of in here. We'll do a bit of it and we'll just see, does it need to get darker? even still it's possible this will also help me understand how the dog is working how the daffodils are working even the sky right because we don't we don't really have any of that information in here yet in fact I might go to my smallest brush here Actually using a like a really small brush allows me to be kind of sloppy with a small brush because then I'm all making all little tiny lines and if it's sloppy it's okay. Um, it'll look better than being sloppy with a big brush. <laughs> so um, uh, let's dive in there. Ooh, okay, buckle up. This is going to take me probably 
45 minutes. Longer than I would like, but as I said, I kind of, I'm kind of digging the way that uh, this is turning out, so I might as well um, dedicate a little bit more time to it. So, we got all these little bits of grass. So part of the trick with this is trying to be, to create um, variation here, so it's not all uh, too uh, unified. How can I make this go faster for myself? Kind of works, it kind of hides the, the lines. Like the goal is to just leave little bits of the background coming through here.
You're too sweet, Kathy. Kathy says, it was a tough choice between watching a um, painting class or a date movie. <laughs> I love watching the process and I get inspired by Michael. Oh. Too sweet, you guys. What I'm, I think what works really well, at least on, as far as I can see on, on my own painting, is kind of starting up top here a little bit more carefully. And then as I get kind of closer towards the bottom, getting with maybe larger, wider brush strokes.
So right now this does look a little bit sloppy, but again, I'm just trying to fill it in as quickly as possible. And then I'll kind of go back in and refine and kind of add some of these lines in a bit more thoughtful manner. I think, you know, there's something to be said about just, like, detail, but sometimes you can just put so much detail in there that it's, it's even if it's sloppy, it just overwhelms the viewer's ability to kind of make sense of it. And, you know, like, that's, a, you know, in a way, like, that's one of the secrets of Impressionism. If you put enough little dots and dabs of paint... It might look kind of sloppy up close, but if you stand back, it all kind of comes together. And I'm not saying all Impressionism is sloppy, but there's definitely... I mean, if you look at some of those paintings, they you can see how quickly they're constructed. And there's definitely... you know, there are some Impressionist painters who, who took, you know, a much longer time to complete a painting than others. zoom back out. And you can see that he just kept going, right? He, he's going... So that's why doing this initial layer here, it doesn't really phase me if it looks a little sloppy because so much of whatever sloppiness we might see here just gets completely obliterated. So I don't think there's any point in, in being super diligent about making it perfect. I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of feel... Like it's pretty good here. mix a bit of glazing fluid in here. And a little bit. I'm just going to mix, yeah, my warm blue. Just look at a little bit darker. Okay, 
how am I doing for time? Okay, let's hurry up here. Okay. Sometimes I, I get a little bit of my fingertip there. It was dirty. Just have to be careful I don't wipe too much paint away when you do stuff like that. Now, a few things I could do. I could glaze a, over top of that. That would go a long way to quickly darkening this whole painting. That is the quick and dirty way. I'm going to see if I can give myself another 10 minutes of patience. So this is that uh, this color but with more uh, warm blue in it One thing that I'm trying to correct right now is I, when I went around with the green, I, I literally painted around the head as a way I was just getting kind of lazy. And so now there's sort of like a bit of a line, or, or at least there was, of this darker area around. So I'm just trying to kind of correct that. Because I don't want a line, otherwise... You know, it's, I want something that's not quite, uh, like a, a broken outline. Otherwise, it's going to really stand out as being very different than the rest of the painting. This, that's working out really well. I like how this is turning out now. So all that kind of sloppiness, remember how quickly I was doing that, now is sort of falling into place. And I would argue that the way that I've done it is probably very close to the way that he did it. And that... I'm not saying the results would be better than if I took my time and really put every single piece of grass in the quote-unquote right place. But the the difference is, though, is that my fear of, of going too slow is it could get too organized and start to look uh, like a pattern. Um, whereas we want something that's... Like, grass is very chaotic. And so something about going really fast like that, for me, is faster than my brain can kind of um, rein it in and control things.
another thing that kind of helps is going in slightly different directions. So rather than just purely up and down, maybe a little bit more diagonal. Which is kind of a little bit more like cross hatching, right? This is the kind of thing that after today's episode, my eyes are going to be crossed for a couple of hours. Where it's like, whoa, looking at all this detail for so long. Not easy to... And I think I need to get bifocals now. I'm at that age <laughs> where at night, you know, if I go out to a restaurant, I cannot read anything close to my face. I wear contact lenses. Um, and I find like uh, at, at night as my, as the day goes on and I, you know, my brain gets a little bit tired and my eyes get tired. That um, I find it uh, hard. I have to kind of like hold things further away. So I'm, is it nearsighted? I can't see things far away from me without my glasses or contacts in. And now with my glasses or contacts in at night, I can't see things close up to me. So it's like I could take my contacts out and read what's close to me, but it's like they overcorrect or something as my... It, what's funny though is when I went to get my eyes, because I had to get a new prescription, or at least my prescription reconfirmed before I got new contacts, and I went to the optometrist and the guy is like, Okay, well, I don't want to alarm you, and this could be a bit of a shock. And it's like, what? What? what what's do I? Oh my goodness! What is? Do I have like eye cancer or something? What is? Is this is, you know, um, I I uh, this is a kind of uncomfortable thing for me to say. Um, so I I just want to prepare you for for this. And I'm like, what? What? Tell me, what are you talking about? It's like, I think... I think you might need bifocals soon. <laughs> I'm like, oh! Oh, okay, that's that's not bad, that's... Okay. I think, though, he's probably had that conversation go in the way that he was expecting a few times, especially with men, stubborn men. Who like to think of themselves as still being 20. Let's start out good. Yeah, I think, you know, on camera, I think it's looking better and better. And In person, I feel good about it. Like, again, there was that time, maybe 20 minutes ago, where it was looking kind of pretty rough. I mean, I wasn't too concerned about it, because I, I was expecting I would do something like this after and kind of clean it up. But I just say that because I know there's probably a few people who are going to follow my lead there and potentially give up. On the painting, they'll just be like, oh my goodness, what on earth have I done? It's a disaster. And so it's just a reminder that you just have to keep on going. It's not a disaster. Your painting's just not finished yet. Just put a little bit more on there and all that sloppiness starts to serve its purpose. Because you're painting chaos. Now, 
I guess as I'm getting closer to finishing the grass, the questions I ask myself now are, well, what else needs to be done? I think potentially I could, you know, the sky could have now, now in retrospect, could have been darker. But, again, my brain is just not big enough to be able to make that decision, you know, 40 steps ahead of where I am now, right? Just 40 steps ago. I need to see the painting coming together before I can make a definitive judgment. That's why I like to go background, foreground, background, foreground, background, foreground, you know, uh, at least once so that I can make a more accurate, informed judgment as to how things are unfolding. Let's just compare. Obviously, he just keeps on going, uh, but I think that I'm okay with that. So now I'm, I just, I'm probably going to do a little bit of work on the dog. Maybe I could even do a little bit of glazing here, which is not exactly what he did. Um, I think I need to shape that head a little bit, and. In fact, maybe, well, maybe I should do it with a brown. So I'm going to glaze with a dark brown. And maybe before I do that, I'm just going to clean some brushes. There's also a lot of texture here that'll slowly um, go away as the painting dries. And speaking of which, I'm just going to hit this with the blow. Okay, so let's take uh, some glazing fluid and let's take our small brush again. I'm going to take this brown and just go into the glazing fluid and this is going to make it really transparent. I did take a little bit of life off of this brush doing that. It was pretty hard on the, oops, on this brush. So it's kind of frayed a little bit.
Now we don't have to outline everything. Oops. Okay, let's just take a little bit more brown and go in here and so will just sort of darken in a few places, I think.
I might have gone a little dark on that. That's okay. I'll blow dry that in a moment, but let's just sort of go back down to our dog, because, you know, actually, you know what, let's... I want to... Okay, we're getting pretty close to the end of this painting, so I'm just going to... I'm doing little finishing touches around here, like, the with the dog and the flowers. I think the grass is all done. Um, so... Maybe, yeah, let's look at the dog again. With the dog, I need to get a little bit lighter. there for the forehead
gonna take some warm red. <laughs> red. That looks really bright on camera, but I assure you it's nowhere near that bright in person. Uh, I don't mind it like that, even if it's like that. <laughs> Kind of makes them look a little bit evil, I guess. Uh, actually, not that bad. Um, okay, I'm going to come back up to the daffodils. The brown that I put in here along the, those openings feels a little bit much. So let's take some white. Let's just take a bit of glazing fluid here just to thin that out a little bit. Let's put a bit more yellow in there. Not sure, is that a good idea? Actually, he's almost gone the opposite direction, hasn't he? Okay, I think that's probably good enough. Right? Maybe do I just want to... I might go back over these, that purple a little bit. Do I have any more purple left? Let's take some cool um, red. Let's take our cool blue, just because that'll behave similarly to what we did there earlier. And where's my black? Do I got any black left?
That's kind of cool. It's pretty subtle. But boy, it just sort of gives some extra little oomph in this dark area. I'm expecting it to dry very dark and be mostly invisible unless you're really looking at the painting. But as I said, that's sort of what a lot of artists want is to reward the person who, who is willing to give the painting a little bit more time and thought. And, to do a little glaze right in here. Okay, so let's do... Uh, yeah, let's actually, we can just... You know, I need to blow dry that first. Okay, so I'm just going to take my glaze. So this is, I was using this earlier. This is just um, my brown, my warm brown. So warm yellow, warm red, warm blue, and some uh, satin glazing fluid. All right, and depending on, on the, the ratio of the glazing fluid, we can make it um, darker or lighter. And I'm just going to go around here and very subtly darken a few things. in a way that is much easier to do with glazing fluid than it would be to just continue to mix colors and try to darken things. So I've, what I've done is, is brought this one, the back leg into clear focus. And that tail could be lighter. some white. So this is just pure white paint. And there's Mazab says, I'm late. Whoa. <laughs> I hope that's a good whoa.
So I'm gonna be careful about putting too much white all over here. So I think, you know, because this is so dark in and around that area, defining that shape right there, so that line coming a little bit closer to the tip of the nose is really important. Yeah. You know what, maybe <laughs> one last little thing here. I'm gonna take my dark color. Just going over the top of that. red dot there we go okay <laughs> uh, so I think okay so uh, after hours of painting here um, about three and a half hours of painting I thought I'd be done about three hours so it's not bad Let's do our side-by-side -side comparison. Now, before we do that, just a quick reminder to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and then hit the notification bell so you know when upcoming episodes are taking place. There's gonna be another one on Thursday, and then after Thursday, I have no idea. It could be the weekend, it could be midnight one night, I have no idea. So that's the notification bell helps you know when these sort of surprise episodes are happening because my schedule's all over the place. Um, if you want to support the channel, a few simple ways is um, clicking on some of the links down below, purchasing things using some of the affiliate links from Amazon, letting your friends know, joining the Facebook group, uploading a picture of today's painting or anything else you've been working on, even if it's one of the drawing uh, episodes that you're, you're currently working through, the drawing course I did. Upload those to the Facebook group, join the Facebook group if you haven't already, of course. And then if you want to support the channel with a small donation, feel free to use the PayPal. You can use the YouTube Super Chat function. Or the best bang for your buck is sending an e-transfer through my email, which can be found on my website, or contact me through the Facebook group. Those are, I just don't put it on here because otherwise I get bombarded by Russian trolls constantly. So, uh, But otherwise, let's take a look at today's painting and see how we did side by side.
Okay. So, I think all in all, when um, side by side looks pretty good. Interesting, like, I mean, I could continue to darken this. I mean, I am slightly tempted to do a dark glaze over top, and that would really get me much closer to the one on the left. But, you know, I kind of like how the, what I've got here so far, how that looks. So I think I'm just going to keep it like that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that means that this area is lighter, and this area is also lighter. Um, it would probably make sense if this was darker, and to give a little bit more contrast, but... Um, I'm not going to do that. I think I'm, I'm happy enough. I really like how this worked out in here. That purple on top of the green, I think, is really nice. His is just very, very dark. and I mean, it's possible that it's exactly like what I've done here. Um, it just, maybe the photograph is, you know, I wasn't able to brighten anything up in there. So I'm happy with kind of the general, the painting itself, you know, where, how everything's composed. So let's just zoom in and take a look at the details. Um, yeah, I mean, you can see that sky is definitely brighter uh, on mine. I don't mind that though, it's, yeah, I mean, potentially a little bit more of a teal, I think could be flattering, especially can, we got some purples and these yellows in there would have worked well, but all in all, not too bad. Uh, the clouds, as you remember, we painted purple underneath and then painted white over top. And so we that's how we get that little bit of a edge. If you don't like that at all, then don't paint the purple, just go right to the white. I'm kind of ambivalent about that. I think it's it's it works. Maybe in some places I could have maybe painted a little bit more of that purple out. Not bad though. Obviously, the cloud shapes are a little different. I might have, I could have been a little, like mine, you know, they, they look too amoeba-like. His are a, li a lot more loose, and um, so that's just something to think about. Do I want it to be more blob shape or more kind of sketchy and, and loose on the frayed on those edges? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's okay. Let's go down here now. Um, I'm okay with the way the fence turned out. I think it worked out pretty well. Now that I'm looking at it, I see he actually did a little bit of darkening in between. And that's pretty, that's pretty smart. Okay, let's just, I gotta do a little. So I'm just taking my this paintbrush I just was doing glazing on the dog, just painting quickly over top of the white there. And that kind of just that's nice. It kind of just let's do that again real quick over here. And then I'm just smudging it out with my finger just to get rid of any hard lines in there. So I'm really kind of just very delicately dry brushing here. Okay, let's just come back there. I think that, that helps. You know, we could also do a little bit of this on these rocks too, just to kind of give them A little bit of shading ever so slightly. I 
See, this is why I love glazing, is that we can just do little things like this right at the end of the painting. And we can kind of get away with a lot. It's very subtle. But it does give it a tiny little bit of dimension that maybe they looked a little flat. You can see, especially this one right here, he did something like that to it. Um, let's just look at the grass here. Yeah, I don't mind. I think it's it's growing on me. I, I could, if I was to do any glazing right there, I think I'd be so tempted to start adding kind of like uh, planes, like um, uh, horizontal areas rather than just flatten it out like I would kind of maybe have but but that's not in his painting so I don't want to go too far or drift too far from the original let's look at our dog now one thing I notice is his dog appears to be sort of its head is up a little bit more whereas mine is almost a little bit what did I do Right? You could also see that his is darker. And it's also remarkable that his is darker, and yet the grass is also darker. So there's less contrast, and he you know, brilliantly used tiny brushes. Like his, Again, his painting's only an inch bigger in both directions than mine. And yet he's able to get all those super tiny details. That's so impressive. It almost looks like it's been scratched out with the opposite side of the paintbrush which is entirely possible. That's actually, you know what? Maybe that's exactly what he did. So it, it wouldn't surprise me if instead of using the tip of his brush, he instead used the, the, the pointy end, you know, the right? And used that to, like, he might have painted all of this brown and then just kind of carved back into it with the other end of the brush. Um, in order to get those really sharp little details. I, I'm just realizing that now, but... Um, yeah, I mean, not exactly the, the same. I, my brown is definitely lighter. Although, you know, when I look at it on in real life, it is much closer to the one that we see there. And then let's kind of bring it back to home here with the, the um, subject, ostensibly, of this painting, the giant daffodils and I'm happy with the way that turned out I might I it, just like I was saying I could have been a little bit less heavy-handed with these outlining in between those petals which he did but very subtly I kind of went pretty bold with it so you know it is what it is I could easily eliminate that but I don't mind it only one I kind of mind is up there, but um, ideally what I would probably do, I was thinking a few times, maybe I should just Google daffodils and then use that as reference while I'm doing that. And that, so that would be smart, but um, <laughs> I'm done for the day. Okay, so thank you everyone for painting along with me today, um, for watching this long episode. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you guys on Thursday for another episode where we're also going to look at Horace Pippin again. This time we're going to do a portrait of George Washington or do... <coughs> Excuse me. I didn't have time to mute my microphone. It happened pretty quick. So on Thursday, we're going to do a, re a remake uh, Horace Pippin's Portrait of George Washington. I'm really interested in that one. There's, um, I'm sure, a very interesting story to tell about that painting uh, and why, as an African American, he selected George Washington of all people to depict 
So we'll talk about that on Thursday. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you everyone for painting along and we will see you again very soon. Good night. Ha, ha, ha.